Before anyone can write or enjoy history, we have to find out what actually happened in the past. All the history books ever written stem from detective work done by historians, usually by searching through written records. That limits the things that historians can research, since most experiences never get written down. Ordinary life especially exists only as memories that fade and die with each successive generation. It doesn't have to be like that, however. Tape recorders can catch and preserve them, and then we can build a picture of days gone by. Here's one example from Preston's recent history, based on recordings made 20 years ago by the then Lancashire Polytechnic, with people mostly born around 1914. Preston may be Britain's newest city, but it's also Lancashire's oldest borough, with a charter issued in 1179. It was already a market town then, prospering because it lay at the geographical heart of Lancashire. Today, everything and everybody comes by road or rail, but the River Ribble played a significant but little-known part in building up connections with the outside world. Many people are surprised to learn that for most of the 20th century, Preston was a seaport. Stanley Brown, for instance, made his career at sea, but still remembered that. It, it was a, a big um, revelation to me that there was a port here. When I was away at sea, I, I knew Preston was a place on a map, and having lived in the south of England, a foreign country up there, you know, and it never port, no such thing. And then, towards the end, I remember sailing with a chap who, who had come back from coasting ships, and he described Preston as a port. I thought, rubbish. Yes, ships got. And then, having come to live well in Ansdell, then uh, just near there. I've lo and behold, I see a river and I see ships going up and down and pilots going up. And suddenly I realised there was a port up here. Yes. And so then uh, when the ferry service started, I uh, joined them. And then from there into pilot service and that sort of brought me ashore here. Hmm. Originally, boats sailed right up to the town, but this was only possible at high tides and then only for very small craft. So by 1850 the traffic was disappearing. Preston Corporation took the brave decision to dig out an entirely new dock on the north bank of the river, between the town and the sea, that could handle sizeable ships. Despite local opposition and many misgivings, it opened as the Albert Edward Dock in 1892. Preston was much more than just a cotton town, and formed part of a diverse mid-Lancashire economy, so the traffic coming into the dock was extremely varied during Stanley Brown's time as a river pilot on the Ribble. There was a fair old Baltic trade and uh, and uh, from Norway and Sweden with timber um, and Esparto grass and stuff like that from um, North Africa. Uh, a few fruit birds coming in from the Canaries and places like that. Yeah. Uh, you, you mean you wouldn't get it? You wouldn't get people for uh, ships coming in from. Um, uh, say Australia, New Zealand, you know, with, with fruit and mutton and all that sort of thing. Not not the big boats, but the, the smaller foreign-going ships, especially the the, uh, the 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 nearer trades would come in from all the, all the European um, ports. Yeah. Access to the new dock still depended on high tides, for the Ribble does not carve out a deep channel even near its mouth. The dock basin was the largest of its kind in Britain and was sealed off by two lock gates, like those on canals. At high tide, ships could sail in and out, but by closing them at other times, the water level inside was kept high, even when the river emptied. I did, I had, did pilot a ship once called the Tropic, which was a short saddle boat which normally would have run to uh, Australia, New Zealand. She was 8,000 tons, a, a old Liberty ship uh, during the war, maybe heard of Liberty ships, so they built them by the thousand for, you know, in, with American mass-produced methods. And... Um, and I had her down, somebody had her up and I had her down. Um, I remember going down to the, uh, uh, on, the, on, the, the on the left side of the dock there, going down to take him, uh, took him down at three hours before tide, get him down to the lock gates ready for going out. And when I up here, great big high ship, when we got down to the lock gate, there's nothing. It's dry. Did I come up there? He'd come up at night. Yes. Yeah, and am I going out that way? I said, yes, you are. 
Oh, Betty, you and me said, oh, well, you know all about it. Don't you know that? He pushed off. Was it? Well, I know he got quite a shock to see that's where he'd come up at night. But, of course, the river filled up all right, and being light ship, yeah, there was water enough to float him, but there's plenty of, water, of room this way and that way. Oh, yeah, yes, this way. <laughs> Manoeuvring ships in and out through the locks was an expert job, and there was no time to waste. Tugs, therefore, played an essential part in the port's operations, and Jack Smith described his duties as a tug skipper. You look and got the time of eye water in the tide booth, and then we had to be aboard at three and a quarter hours before eye water. It was during the day, and the harbour master was in his office. We got the orders then for what we had to do that tide. But it was during the night, and the harbour master wasn't in his office. That dock office was closed. He left orders for us what we had to do. And here's uh, an example: the Charles Earn attend the ferry out, the second lot. So I had the Charles Earn then, so my job was tow the ferry out in the second lock at 20 hundred hours. That's mm. 8 o'clock. Mm. The Jemison attend the Zena out after the ferry. Now Zena was a ship that carried timber and wood pulp used to run up the Baltic. And the John Herbert attend the Irene, that was a Swedish ship, attend the Irene out after the ferry. That's at 21 hours. Be in attendance at 20.45. That's quarter to nine. Now then, that was for Thursday, December the 1st. Friday... Earn and Jemison tide work. Sometimes we were tide work, sometimes we were day work. So Earn and Jemison tide work, Herbert day work. All three tugs in the first lock at three hours to eye water and attend the Empire Nordic in, the, M the Ionic Ferry in, and the Inga in. That was three ships docking that tide, and they each wanted a tug. So that that was more or less the usual run of things. And I've, I've seen Monday, PM tide, the afternoon tide, was the busiest tide of the week. Of course, all the ships that came in, maybe Friday or Saturday, the ships that were loading coal, they were ready to sail. And the ships that had come in and had discharged the cargo, they were ready to sail. And I've seen in the dock basin, you can nearly step from one ship to another and go right across the basin. There was that many ships in the basin. And we've known as many as 17 and 18 ships sailing on one tide. You can say roughly, the docks only open from an hour and a half to high water to an hour after high water, an hour's ebb. Sometimes longer than that, it's sometimes stretch it. But that was the general thing. So that's only two and a half hours. And they've got to get all that shipping out and all the shipping in. And if there wasn't enough pilots, to put on that 17 ships. The first ship to go out would have a pilot on board. The ship that followed him would have no pilot. He'd follow, follow the ship that had the pilot. And maybe the fourth or the fifth ship, he'd have a pilot on. And a couple behind him, they'd follow him down. And that's the way they had to do, to get the shipping in and out. <coughs> if the skipper, some of the skippers would sail without a pilot, they knew the river so well. But if the skipper wouldn't sail without a pilot, to save him missing a tide and sailing the following tide, they put a pilot on that ship. And then the regular traders who were behind him, who knew the river fairly well, they'd follow that ship down. 
His first tug was the Lucas. And no one liked the Lucas because she was single screw. That means she'd only one propeller. Well, with the river so narrow, with a twin screw tug, that's two propellers, you have no problem swinging round in the river. But with the Lucas, with only one screw, and my uncle was in the Lucas before I joined the Lucas, and I always swung her all right, but sometimes it was hard work, especially if the wind was easterly. That's blowing against you as you're trying to turn round. I said to him, Ernie, how do you swing the Lucas so easy with an easterly wind? Oh, he said, what do I do? He said, go as far south as I can in the river. Go as far south. Put the wheel hard to starboard. Ring full head in on the engine and close my eyes. <laughs> he said it always works. If she doesn't come round, she'll run high and dry on the opposite bank. <laughs> now, there was people who'd been skipper of the Lucas had to go down to the Nays, where it's wider, to swing her down there. They couldn't do it in the Narrows. But that's what I did after that. As I say, I always managed to swing her. But, you know, your heart's in your mouth. Is she going to come round or isn't she? So I did that. Get as far south as possible. Full head on the engines. Tell the mate to put the wheel out of star, but it closed my eyes. And then if I didn't hear anything, I'd open them again and we'd come round. <laughs> Life aboard was very primitive on the Lucas. We had a cabin forward with two bunks in it. I slept in one bunk, and the chief engineer slept in the other bunk, the other side of the room. And the crew, four of them, they slept aft. The galley was just a small range, you know, there was an oven and, and there was no room, there was no room to turn round even when he went in the galley. Mm. And one loo, and you got to, if you went to the loo, to flush the loo, you got to what they call a draw bucket, that's a bucket attached to a line. You drop that over the side and got a bucket of water and then you flush the toilet with that. You had to wash in a bucket. That, that was life on the Lucas. Even assisted by tugs, heavily laden ships could not reach the dock safely and then cargo was offloaded on the river, something Harry Backer took part in. Then there was a lot of ships who used to lie to them, you know. They used to hire uh, maybe a couple of coasters and you go down to Nelson Boy and and light, take so much of them, so they to lift them up a bit as they could get up river, you know. You might have to go down two or three times to lift her up, you know, to, as she wouldn't be smelling bottom coming up river. Once in dock, the aim was to unload and reload as fast as possible, since ships and crews were too expensive to be left idle. For most of the 20th century, that meant gangs of dockers like Harry had to manhandle cargo with only limited mechanical assistance. At its peak, about 500 men were regularly at the docks, and James Ashton was another of them. I went to McCreevy's uh, carrying timber and slinging and all that. When a ship was in there or anything like that, slinging or winching, but spreading it out at the act, you see, because on the timber side, there's no cranes then. They used to delegate the ship, see? And the uh, winches. They got the winch driver, see, there were four winches on the ship. Two for it, two aft. See? Well, the uh, yards were winched, or uh, you were. <coughs> you went down the wall slinging, or uh, what you call on stage, landing them. So you landing them on the ship's side, and then you lifted them onto the bloke's shoulders, and then you went away with them. And then there were stackers on the, uh, where the stacks of timber were, and the, what they called the fields, there was chaps to were stacking. 
Well, I first started checking for the order in this Dividor at first, I learned the job, you know what I mean? And then I, I got used to it and I uh, went on to corporation after. But before I went on, on to corporation, I used to, have to uh, in between learning checking, carrying timber and going up ships and discharging them. Carrying timber off the ships and going down in the hatches, what they call slinging, slinging tip, uh, timber up the petrol part of the hatches and all like that. Wood pulp used in paper making and timber provided the main cargoes in the long run. Unloading and stacking this timber was very hard work, but skill was involved as well as muscle, as he, Thomas Dawson and Mr Murray agreed. Well, you did learn to walk with sway of your timber, stay on your shoulder. <coughs> but uh, if you, one time a day, you said, you could always tell a doctor, they what they call lopsided. They used to walk like that, honest. Ah, they always tell a doctor. Russian timber, uh, the Redwood Russian timber, it was murder, 4 by 11s and all, 15 feet long, pulled it to the ground. Men started, some cat, apart from the registered dockers, we, we were one, they, when they were very busy, they had to employ casual labour. You know, although we were casual, casual, casual. Inside of half an hour, they chuck it. The brilliant timber was too, too heavy for the shoulders, you know. A new man would have his uh, shoulder padded up. You know, they did wear a, a leather pad over their shoulder, even after they'd been carrying their swinging their stuff back. You see, this stuff had to be put back into the backfield and then delivered from there. Mm. Same with the boards. They, they take uh, five or six thicknesses of boards, you know. Uh, would be equal to about the weight of a deal. You used to get a special kind of leather that they were, they were flexible. And they think in time, although they were never very thick, in time they get used to shape your shoulder, get molded to your shoulder. Well, you used to always have a, a bit of candle, and you rub it with candle. Rub your pad. Well, that had always helped you to, the, the timber used to slide then off. It's had it sticking on in that. You could uh, slide it on. Dock work could be very dirty, as Harry Backer recalled. Oh, uh, China clay were dirty. That were 12 bob a day. You, you work piece work, you got uh, uh, 12 shilling on the ton. Mm. Every hundred ton you got out, 12 shilling like. China clay from Poy and Pear and them places in Cornwall. And then they used to take coal back. Other enterprises used the docks as well. James Ashton worked as a shipbreaker before he took up dock work. It was during the 18 war, uh, I'd say 15, uh, so be about 1918 or something. Anyhow, the war was on and I, uh, I went as apprentice. Uh, to Oliver Avers in Fox Street, it was a printer's, and I went to as apprentice printer, you know. Mm. But I wasn't there long. And uh, then I went on to Jewish's as apprentice electrician. Well, I wasn't there long. And then I, uh, because money was, it was, I only got half a crown a week at uh, the printer's. Well, that weren't so much, and I only got similar as apprentice electrician at Jewish's. Mm. So I went to uh, wards on the docks when I was 17 year old. Well, I mean, I jumped from half a crown a week to about 18 shilling. Well, a big item, you know. It was on the uh, scrapping ships from the 14, 18 war. And wards, every time they got a ship in, you get at work for about 12 or 18 months, and then when the ship was finishing, well, they played job site till they got bought another ship. And that's how you work. You work between the docks and wards, and that's how I did for uh, up to about 1928, after about a year after I got married. The corporation had originally hoped that the docks would earn money to reduce the rates in Preston, as well as boosting the local economy. However, traffic never developed to that level, and heavy spending was regularly called for to keep the operation competitive.
So a new generation of tugs replaced the Lucas and her sister ships, for instance, and made the Corporation Committee's supervisory duties more pleasurable as well. After that, I went to the, the Hewitt. That was the first of the twin screw tugs. And they were all more or less built the same. The Hewitt, the John Herbert, the Frank Jemison, and the Charles Earn. And on the Frank Jemison and the John Herbert, there was a, a big saloon built into the tug for one reason only. That was for when the councillors went down the river for what they called the, the river inspection. Some of them never saw the river. <laughs> There was a, it was a lovely saloon with a pantry, electric heater, uh, settees running all the way around, two tables, and to go down that saloon, you'd wonder how they could have built it into the tug. It was so big. Now the Hewitt the first of the new tugs that they got. She was called after Councillor Hewitt. He was on the Ribble Committee, and he was a strict teetotaler. And he would not have a saloon on that tug for the simple reason that when the committee went down the river, they never run short of anything. They were never thirsty. <laughs> So I used to go down and play cards and have the drink and in moderation they didn't get drunk or anything, but that that was the that was a trip. But Hewitt, Councillor Hewitt, would not have a saloon on that tug if it was going to be called after him. So near to Liverpool docks, and also to Manchester and its ship canal, Preston always struggled to get and keep trade. In its latter days, that encouraged some pioneering developments, starting with roll-on, roll-off services. The first ones were the old tank landing craft that had done the big beach work at some of these landings. So they were all chartered from the um, government, were all on empires. They were Empire, uh, Doric, Gaelic, Cedric, and so on, Nordic. Mm. They, they had had a service going from London to Hamburg, uh, the London River to Hamburg River, for about a year before Colonel Bustard, who is a private enterprise on his part, came up to Preston and started across here. And uh, they'd been running two or three months when I uh, got an interview and left the railway boats and came here, but I was handy for home, mm. you see. Um, now that really was the, 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 the beginnings of, of roll-on, roll-off service in the world. I don't think there was a, an equivalent sort of uh, commercial service, apart from the railway um, uh, trains out of um, Dover. Mm. You know, the railway boat ran the trains Dover-Dunkirk, and, and I think they had a, a, a ferry in the north, of, I don't know if you carried a few cars. But for commercial traffic, uh, laden, road wagons uh, to carry cargo on wheels without touching it. That was that's the way it all started there at Preston Dock. They also began using containers for cargo. Preston to Larn was the start off, then we developed Larn Ardrossen and then later on Pre Preston Dublin. Yeah. Now this you see was the most marvellous thing since sliced bread as far as people were concerned because um, the, the the ferries had been charging, I don't know, um, on a square footage, what the area of the unit cover. And lorries and things were, were you've got a cab, and or if you, you're not the trailer, it's still got wheels and all sorts now, and containers much shorter, much uh, more compact, isn't it? And I forget how we did our charges, but uh, once you've got them into small ships, we didn't need an enormous great tank landing craft. We uh, had nice little compact ships that could carry 20 little wee ships, yeah. 200 feet long, and things like that. Well packed. Uh, the job could be done for peanuts virtually. The owner of the first ship, Arnold Hoff, Rotterdam, 
built a beautiful little thing called the clipper, which is built to fit the key in Preston absolutely to the inch, as much of ship as he could get in. And we like to think that was the first con pure container ship, custom built container ship built, the clipper, and that came to Preston. It wasn't enough to the dismay of those working at the dock. I never in my wildest dreams never pictured the dock closing. And a number of people have asked me why did the dock have to close? Well, there's several answers to that. The modern shipping now, especially the roll-on, roll-off, like Fleetwood, for instance, where they run, that container boat comes in, discharges and loads and sails straight away. The container boats that came into Preston, they discharge and load, but they've got to wait 12 hours before they can sail. And then they've got 17 mile of channel to navigate before they get out clear of the river. Another thing, there's a lot of trade now done on the east coast from the continent. And that is obvious. Instead of leaving Rotterdam, for instance, and coming all the way the English Channel and up the west coast to Preston, when only got to cross the North Sea. Like places like Immingham and Felixstowe and Harwich. So when you think, well, there are the reasons. I don't like going on the dock now. Yeah. To see it now, and after knowing it for 32 years, working on it for 32 years. It's hard to believe. I've seen all, all around the dock, not just one ship alongside, two ships abreast of one another. There was that much shipping in the dock. Sad though closure was, it was probably inevitable. Besides the reasons Mr Smith gave, Preston had never developed a strong international trade apart from timber, and even that was unreliable. The city is central for Lancashire as a whole, but it lies on the northwestern edge of the county's industrial area, with nothing further north to generate additional trade, as the Midlands do for Liverpool. The river channel was always difficult, since the whole Lancashire coast silts up continuously, and only expensive, constant dredging maintained access to the dock from the sea. Locating it north of the river made road and rail access difficult, and the coasting trade was changing and shrinking anyway by the 1970s. Ships in general were rapidly getting bigger. Most of Liverpool's old docks were abandoned around this time, and shipping has now ceased to use the Manchester Ship Canal. The corporation never had the resources to provide machinery comparable to that found in larger ports, and if it had, most of the dockers would have been made redundant. Taken all round, we should respect the courage involved in such a major project, but recognise that it had never earned significant profits, or became as important to the local economy as the Trafford Park Industrial Estate next to the Ship Canal did in Manchester. Today, as a marina and a link to the Lancaster Canal, Preston Dock remains busy and continues helping to support the Preston economy in a modest way. The redevelopment of the surrounding area has also helped the city update its facilities and maintain its regional standing. History is about understanding change, not ignoring it, and studying episodes like that created by Preston Dock provides a perfect example of what memories can contribute to the process. <laughs>